Is it time for a story? Oh my god. Technology scared me. I actually thought maybe I'd become a social worker or a librarian. In Southern Connecticut State College had opportunities to make me better at being those two things. And librarian to me was somebody who learned how to figure things out. And so I did decide to enroll in the library science program. And my first day in the library science program, they had an orientation meeting in Bewley Library, the fourth floor. And the fourth floor had things that I had never seen before. Now, yeah, if you look at my hair, you can see that there's a little bit of aging that has happened. So I'm not the same age as maybe some of you listening. And in that room, there was a tape deck, at least that's what I determined it was later, that was about half the size of me. Um, and it was like, oh my God, I'm supposed to learn how to use that. And there were other things that were called CD players, and I had no idea what a CD mm -hmm. was. And there were things with a lot of buttons, buttons, and buttons that I had to actually like take off my glasses to be able to read some of the little inscriptions on the side. And what does a power button do? I literally was in that room wandering around looking at this like stuff that's really dinosaurs for today or what we would consider like really historic technology and started to feel my heart beating through my chest. I became so anxious that I walked into that room weighing 114 pounds and I left weighing 108. I literally started perspiring. It, it was running down my back. I was so incredibly anxious. I was literally having a anxiety attack for the first time in my life. And then I realized that this stuff was scaring me so much that it was going to be the most expensive decision of my life to withdraw from library science master's program at Southern because I literally could not foresee pushing those buttons and having an idea how to, to use them and going into those little booths that had headphones on them. It was absolutely terrifying. So I dropped out. It was very expensive. I eventually got a job with a insurance company and I got picked to work on a special project. They called it Care Online. And this vice president had tapped me and he said, um, I really need somebody to work on this project. And it turns out that you have a master's in research and statistics now. And um, it says you've had programming. And I didn't tell him that my dissertation was qualitative analysis versus quantitative because I couldn't figure out a lot of the quantitative stuff. And even though I learned a little bit about the T square is that? What is that T thing anyway? Um, somebody in the audience probably could tell me better. But I was not really totally getting it. But I had got the qualitative stuff, the storytelling aspects of data. Um, and I fumbled with that as well. Went down to the Yale Computer Center another big room with lots of things no buttons just these big tin can kinds of things around the room and i had my little deck of cards and i would go in and in those days you didn't type into your computer you put this deck of cards and you had to figure out which button to push to make it be a reader and i got that down and i was getting my data read and i went down a couple of times and it wasn't quite right the last time I go down with my deck of data, just before the thesis is supposed to be written, I needed one more section of analysis, and I had 278 cards to be read. And it was a rainy day, something like today, which didn't encourage many of you to get out here and listen to this story. You're going to have to hear it on TV. Um, I dropped that deck of cards. 
yeah, that, oh, damn it, I was losing weight again. Anxiety, am I gonna be able to finish this thesis in time? Technology got me like into that state of panic one more time. Come on in and sit in a chair. So there I was um, having this real phobia for technology. And so when I turned 50, I said to myself, um, oh, there is a backtracking I'm going to do here in this story to that vice president who asked me to work on Care Online. He took a phone call, and it wasn't the kind of phone call you'd take today. He basically was buzzed on something on his hip, and he had to be called away. And he left me there, and he said, okay, run it. And I'm sitting there with a basic program code in front of me on this little computer that he was working on something at home. And he said, run it. And I had no idea what he meant. And again, that stillness, that palpitation, that anxiety overcame me. This time I didn't sweat, I just became extremely still, like holding my breath, waiting for an answer to come out of the air. And he comes back and he says, did you run it yet? And then over my shoulder, he just pushes the enter button and there it goes. And I'm like, holy shit, that's all I needed to do. An enter button. And none of this would have occurred, none of this panic, none of this stillness would have overcome me if I just knew to push the enter button. So what I knew from these three experiences is that I had something to overcome. I definitely had a fear of technology. How could that be? <laughs> I'm here seven days a week running a tech organization um, that has all kinds of tech challenges. There's cameras and editing, and I've got to train people. How did I get to this place? I'm not quite sure, but because I lost so much money that first time because of the library science program, I was very interested in my corporate employer paying for me to overcome this fear. So I had an opportunity to get free tuition to go to Quinnipiac in the e-media program. And there I was able to excel. I thought I was doing good, but they gave every, nobody got a C in anything. Mm. You know, if you were doing badly, you got a B minus, but pretty much everybody was treated like they were doing really well. And I assumed I was, and you know, maybe I was. But right after I graduate, I see this little thing online and it says, how tech savvy are you? Take this quiz and see just how tech savvy you are. And I fill it all out and I'm thinking, ah, oh, at least I should make a reasonable good score on this now that I've overcome and I've got this degree in media, uh, e-media, electronic media. And it came back scoring like an old person who had never seen a computer before. <laughs> <laughs> and I got still again. But I'm here every day to serve you, hoping that media and technology can make a difference in all of our lives. Yay. If I can do it, folks, so can you. Best clip yet. This is time for expanding questions where people who have heard the story might have something that they've heard that they want to know a tiny bit more about. Could you expand a little bit on what your thesis was? That requires me not to have dementia. <laughs> <laughs> I do rem recall that it was qualitative, and it, actually it was about veterans. Um, it was about veterans' use of college resources after they came back from Vietnam. And the potential of creating a social gathering place for them uh, because they felt, did they feel alienated from the community of students enough because of their age differences and their maturity mm -hmm. that they needed a separate space. 
and there were, was a um, willingness on the part of Jack Mordante, who actually might still be at Southern uh, some 40 years now, to experiment with the space. So I was able to do a survey with those that were actively using the space and those that did not, and um, proved that um, creating veteran spaces in, in colleges would serve uh, the community as a whole. Any other expanding questions? How did you actually come upon the job here? At WPAN. The job is not paid, so anybody willing to do it for <laughs> free probably could have gotten it. Um, actually, I was president of the League of Women Voters in New Haven in the 80s, and lady kept knocking on my door. She was a nurse. And there was a small core of advocates that were very interested in the movement of community television. The very first nonprofit community TV station was set up in 1986 in New Haven. It still serves New Haven. It serves West Haven, New Haven, and Hamden. It was a, I believe, four-year legal battle to enable them to establish this first nonprofit. By the time they actually got to the point of establishing the nonprofit, the, um, most of the people that were advocates were burnt out. In fact, this little nurse moved to North Dakota or something. She just needed headroom. Um, and I ended up becoming a um, incorporator. I was one of the people that signed the papers to allow that nonprofit to come into existence because at that point so many people had gone and were burnt out. And so I kept involvement in community access no matter what community I was in after that. And um, because this community um, has such a rich and awkward story in history um, with community access, I decided that I wanted to prove that if it was done right, it could flourish. So thank you for asking. Yeah, how, how long have you been doing it? So I've been an active advocate of community TV for 30 years, but I've actually been full-time here keeping the doors open for six um, as of May. Um, almost seven days a week for six years and except for the fact that the seats are not full tonight um, I know that what we're doing is working and at least the peers in the industry think it's great because we won best in the US for our size um, this year so we have a lot to share with you folks um, come and be part of our story project and uh, is anyone interested in sharing a story besides the one you just heard does anyone feel up to doing a first story tonight? I have so many. I don't know which <laughs> one to the choose. First, yeah, everyone has a lot of firsts. The question is, you know, is it a story that can create an emotional response? And that's where the challenge is. And that's what we hope to explore, to give you an opportunity to test your wings as a first-time storyteller, um, to actually meet some storytellers that are um, experienced. Uh, so it's really going to be whoever shows up and doing whatever feels right for them. I'll share a story. I'm going to pretend that this is, that that's, I'm, I'm in my living room with friends. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm going to pretend, that's it. <laughs> so um, the, the, the story that I want to share is um, when I first met, who's now my husband. So I was going through uh, kind of a very rough, a patch in my life where I wasn't sure where my life was going um, and um, I just was really kind of down and just just figuring out why where is my life going the person I was whose house I was living at um, she said to me she says you you barely just get out of your room when you're not working you just come and sit there why don't you you know go out to um, the movies or do something and I said, I don't have anybody to go with. And then, you know, she said, well, go by yourself. And I said, oh, no, I, I, I can't do that. And then she said, why not? And I said, well, I'm not that type of person. And then she says, well, what do you mean? And, and the reason I had such a strong reaction is um, I am from Colombia. And back then, when I was living in Colombia, if a woman went to the movies by herself, it was the equivalent to a woman going here to a bar by herself. That was just sort of like the perception. It's like you're just looking for trouble or to have like a one night stand kind of thing. And I was just kind of offended that she suggested that I would go to the movies by myself. So in that 
so just please don't know here people go to the movies by themselves all the time i was at that time in a very small town um in new york and um uh, and she says oh no here it's not a problem so i and she says go early so you can just have your time to park the car and all of that and this is but this is over 20 something years ago when we didn't have the multiplex um you know cinemas it was just one theater and i had that little window that faced the outside to face the street and you came and you get your ticket that was that type of theater so i got there early and i went and i got my ticket and then you have to wait outside because it's only one how do you call it? one only one room theater. one only one theater there's no it's just only one moving plane at a time it was a summer day, it was in June. Once you have your ticket, you wait outside for the people who are in the previous showing to come out, and then you start making a line to go into the theater. And as I was into this line, I ended up being behind this family, and they were chatting, and they were talking, and whatever, and I was just by myself. And, and so then he asked the woman, which I thought it was the wife and the daughter, he asked the woman, a question about how's how's the school rock they were talking about how children's television has changed so much and there were not really nice uh, educational programs for children anymore and they were talking about how how's, how's the school rock so the woman was from california and i think it was a deep, uh, different age and that was something that she wasn't familiar with so he turned to the person behind which was me which was almost I figured I was almost his age and this, he says oh you have to know you know a schoolhouse rock by then I had been in the US for less than a year and I have no idea I thought it was a band mm -hmm. because I hear the word rock and so I thought it was how a school rock was a band and I said no I'm not familiar with that band and I said, what band? So, so we, we begin talking and he explained to me what it was. And when by now the line is moving, so I'm behind this family, I'm talking to the husband and we keep going, we keep going. And it's a small theater, so you, with the four of us, so his family and I went up in sitting in the same row. And then I see that he's not talking to his wife or his daughter anymore. And I'm like, isn't she gonna get upset or jealous or whatever? And then we end up I she you know when they show the previews if, you know the the wife and the daughter were just focused on those the stuff that comes before the questionnaire and the trivia and all that and he kept talking to me and I see that she's not upset and I said well maybe it's not his wife maybe it's his sister and that's why she's not upset and then we kept talking and the previews came and we were talking and we were talking and the movie ended and went and then we start coming out and i see that the wife or the sister or whoever disappeared well they weren't completely related at all they weren't <laughs> even friends he was he had arrived earlier than me and they have arrived earlier than me and by the time i saw them they were chatting because they were just waiting and talking and so they weren't even co related at all they they didn't even know each other and so we kept talking and we moved into the you know kept walking out of the theater getting to parking lot and then we start we keep talking and all the cars begin to leave and i you know when you're involved in a conversation we're in the middle of the parking lot and then all the cars have left and there was only my car in one stream of the parking lot and his car in the other stream of the parking lot and the police came around and they asked us asked me is everything okay because we are the only people left in the parking lot. By now it's like 11 o'clock at night because we kept chatting. And then I realized, oh my God, it's this late. I have to go home. And, you know, I, I, I was with the person that I was living with. She had, you know, her husband and their kids and they have an alarm in the house. And I, and she must talk. I don't know what happened to her, but maybe she's not coming tonight. I have no idea. She was worried about me. She thought about it. She was going to call the police because it was my first time to the movies by myself. And then I come into the house. The whole alarm goes off. You know, it's like the police came. It was just like this big. And she was so mad at me. But I was just so excited that I had met this great guy. And then, you know, after all that happen and, and stuff I just go to the bathroom and then I see myself for the first time in the mirror 
and of course because I was sad and I was all depressed you know I had the worst hair day no makeup I was wearing a sweatshirt I completely have forgot about that and in my mind I said I'm this is the worst that I could ever look that guy's never gonna call me again and I was just like I went to bed and I said oh and the next day was a whole disaster she was so mad at me she says you cannot live here if you're that irresponsible blah 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 and then almost by the end of the week he called me and he says do you want to go out to the movies again and I, I was you know super excited so this time I dress up I have a dress I have done my hair, I have my makeup, I was wearing a little bit of heels. We met in the same, we were going to meet in the same theater and he was coming after work. And then I'm, I arrive early and then he's running a little bit late and not late, late per se, but not as early as I am. And so he's coming really fast towards me. And then he passes me because he didn't recognize Help. me. <laughs> and so he passes me and so in his mind he says, I'm, I'm running towards the theater and I see this pretty woman looking at me and smiling. I'm like, I don't know who she is. And then he just keeps going. And then as he passes, my, my face changed. Like, where is he going? Like, it's, you know, when you see somebody coming and then it's like, oh, they, then he kind of passes me. And then I just kind of change my head, my, my face. And he just look and he's like, he's like, whoa. And I said, you look different. <laughs> And uh, and that was the the beginning of the of the relationship. And so when I least was expecting it, that's when we found each other, and we have been married for twenty something years, um, twenty three years, you know now. And that's how we met. Wow. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> what was the movie that you saw the first? Time? Apollo thirteen. Oh, with Tom Hanks. Oh, nice. Houston, we have a problem. Do you remember the second movie as well? Pocahontas. So you're oh. not, you're, you don't have that dementia thing going on. Because okay. we met going to the movies. We have this connection to the movies and mm -hmm. it's, one, it's something that we still to this day we enjoy doing together. And I, and I think more than anything else is because that's how we met. So we, we really enjoy going to the movies. So we go, either we go to the movies or we rent movies or we watch movies or something that we do often because we have that connection. Thank you. I think you made a connection yeah. with the audience as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Anybody else want to give yeah. it a try right. for first? We a couple of years ago, my church put out that they do a summer musical every year. It's just a two week commitment. You're, you're automatically in. There's tryouts, but I thought, oh my gosh, I love musicals. I have been obsessed with musicals since I saw Grease when I was in second grade. And I have gone to so many shows, even going to all my sisters throughout high school, but I have never been one. I haven't sang in choir since fourth grade. I know how to play piano. So I'm like, okay, if I like buy some sheet music, I can figure out how to like sing the right notes. I make my boyfriend at the time like carry a keyboard help me that I buy just so I can try out for this show and it's Fiddler on the Roof and I love Fiddler on the Roof so I'm really excited so I learn a really difficult song that is from Into the Woods it's called Moments in the Woods and it's so difficult that the lady who's trying to play the accompaniment like can't even play it. I said, don't worry, I memorized the whole song. I just stood there and I sang out and I felt like I was on glee. I was <laughs> so excited. I'm like, yes, I got this. And I knew I wasn't gonna be getting a named part, but that was fine. I just wanted to be on the stage in the show and the list came out and I was assigned to be a townsperson and I got even a couple lines which I memorized, I highlighted in my book, I was really excited and most of the people in the show are kids ranging from 8 to 18. There's a couple of adults and I get along with the kids great because I've been obsessed with theater my whole life and it's nice to hang around people because day to day I've been working as an engineer and I've been just kind of like 
are hanging around like this guy I end up dumping him right before the show and he always was just saying like what's the point or this and that and it kind of got in my head so I kept thinking that like I'd be driving on the road and I think like what's the point like it was really bad but once I started hanging around these kids and being in the show that voice of like what's the point started getting quieter and all of a sudden one day I was kind of bored with the show in a way because I had like this really small part and doing these really easy dances and I'm like all right I'm doing this but then this weird number came out it's called rumor and I was chosen to be in it and also I'm not in a lot of the sh the acts because I only come in the evenings after work as the kids are there like at the camp mm -hmm. during the daytime so they're like oh well you're not in the daytime so you can't be in this act I'm like, come on I'm just sitting there crocheting like I want to be in it and so this rumor scene they're like all right you get to be in it and there's a couple lines and the director turns to me and she says I want you to sing this and I say no <laughs> oh my gosh you just put me on the spot like that I was so freaked out but I took the sheet music home and I went to my keyboard and I played it and I'm like yeah I can do this so then I had to go ask the teenager who she gave it to who already had like a big number she was the ghost that came out and she had a really awesome part so I knew like she would probably let me have these like two lines and I was so grateful that she let me do that and the night of the show like everyone was just so encouraging and it was like the best community and before my act I wasn't even nervous I was just really excited to get to like sing and have my solo and I had my parents there and they recorded it and um it was like the silliest number it's not even in the movie <laughs> it's cut from the movie okay so my little part was i don't even remember right now exactly but i got to like come out onto the stage and pretend i was like gossiping with these little girls and a girl comes out and she's selling fish and then like come up like right to the mic because I'm not mic'd mm -hmm. and I sing my little part remember Perchick that crazy student remember at the wedding and something like that and then at the very at the rest of the number goes on and at the very end I just totally smile like I can't keep character I am not an actress but I did it and I'm just so happy to be alive. And that little voice is like, what's the point? It's like, this is the point. Hmm. That's really nice. Very good. So, yay. Oh, yeah. Are there any expanding questions on this is the point? Did you go on to do any more musicals or any more yeah. plays? Yeah. So two years later, I was in Annie with the church group, St. Peter's Episcopal Church. And I got to play Frances Perkins. And I didn't have a solo, but I sang Tomorrow with the mm -hmm. cabinet scenes. Oh, that was pretty cool. Do you still get very nervous, like when it's time to come out and like perform, even though your lines are small or big or whatever, you still get very nervous? Yeah. I think so, but it's it's just so much easier with a group. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I'm way more nervous okay. I think, than huh. than being on the stage with a group. Except for the dancing, because I'm so bad at that part. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about television and cameras is time for a story was recorded tonight. So all of those who did not make it to this room, that welcoming room that will be air conditioned in the summer. For those of you that are going to be joining us later this summer, you're gonna know that if you are home and sweltering, you have a place to go on Wednesday night that'll be comfortable, that will provide you with some refreshments. You'll get a chance to um, enjoy the company of others. And hopefully these three stories will inspire you to come uh, and share and be in community with other folks in Wallen Grove in Connecticut. Thank you so much for, for those of you who came tonight, and we look forward to seeing more of you here at Time for a Story.